Thank you so much. It's great to have you uh, let me come on to your program and wrap with you uh, for the next hour or so. Yeah, I'm a kid from Kansas. I, I was born in Wichita, Kansas, where all oceanographers come from. And uh, six months after Pearl Harbor, so I'm a pretty old guy. And during that time, uh, my father uh, then moved the family during the war to California. And he flew with Chuck Yeager. He was part of that right stuff guy. So I don't remember much about Kansas. I woke up in the Mojave Desert, quite honestly. Uh, but after the war, um, my parents moved to San Diego. And that was really where it all happened uh, because we lived just a few yards from the Pacific Ocean. I mean, imagine a kid from Kansas, it's wheat, you know? And all of a sudden I'm looking at a, an ocean expanse that's 72% of the planet. And I, I'm dyslexic. I, I wanna let you know that right up front because I'm very proud of it. I, I, I see it as a wonderful gift uh, because I view the world in a very, very different way. Uh, I travel, I think a lot of explorers are probably just like, we go down paths less traveled by most. And I can remember because I'm dyslexic, uh, I heard about the, the, the book, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, but it was really the movie. And, and this, I'll show you the image. Uh, this is what I was introduced to 20,000. This was a movie produced by Walt Disney, who by the way, I discovered is also dyslexic. And when I saw that, movie i was 12 years old and you know parents always ask what do you want to be when you grow up and i told them i wanted to be captain nemo and fortunately my parents didn't laugh at my dream <laughs> uh, it was crickets yeah i'm sure they went into the other room and said houston we got a problem here but they didn't say that to me they said well tell me more about the nautilus and I said, well, it's a submarine. And they took me down to the sub base in, in Point Loma in, in San Diego. And I went up, but there was a diesel submarine way back then. And I decided I wanted to become a Naval officer. And uh, I'll show you what I did. I went in the Navy and here's showing them a picture of my, uh, all the toys I played with when I first went. So here's, here's that young uh, Bob Ballard uh, going into the United States Navy. Oh, I, am I controlling that or who's controlling that? You or me? Well, anyway, he'll work. It is problem. just like we said. I said just before we went live, uh, if you're watching this, I said, don't worry, it'll be casual, just like you're showing somebody something on your phone. So it is truly casual. Anyway, let's go. <laughs> so anyway, I started, uh, I went into the United States Navy. Here we are. And for about 20 years, while in the United States Navy and then at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, I spent an amazing amount of time in submarines. And my favorite one is the one, uh, the big one, where the people are standing all over it. That's called the NR-1. And it's, uh, it's, it's identical to the Nautilus in the sense that uh, it's a nuclear submarine, but it's small. It's the smallest nuclear submarine that was ever built by the Navy but it has a window and see that was the key the nautilus had a window and so not only did i become an oceanographer uh, i mean become a naval officer i became an oceanographer so I, I lived this dual life of developing toys to take me beneath the sea initially deep diving submarines but then i used these toys to explore the bottom of the ocean that's what i was fixated on when i saw the movie 20,000 leagues under the sea. And I was the first human being, if you can take them to that shot of me exploring the largest mountain range on earth, it's called the Mid-Ocean Ridge. And it runs around our planet like the seam on a baseball. Wait, so can you, for our viewers, just because I just exclaimed the largest mountain range on earth, aren't you an ocean guy? Well, <laughs> that's what was so wild about it when I was... In high school, National Geographic published this chart of the world's oceans. And it showed that the largest mountain range on the planet is not up, it's down, which seems like an oxymoron. But in fact, 
running around the earth like the seam on a baseball is a giant, giant mountain range. It covers 23% of the earth's total surface area. Like that's a quarter of the planet. Yet, here's the cuck, the cucks of it all. We had gone to the moon. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin gone. Astronauts had gone up there. They played golf on the moon. We, we went up there before humans went to the largest feature on earth. And I was lucky to be one of the first human beings. Now, let me show you that crazy place because it's along this great mountain range where the earth is splitting open. It's, it was a concept back then called plate tectonics that this mountain range was absolutely ripping open, forming a deep valley. So in that one image, you'll see mountains on the left and mountains on the right. The mountains on one side are sitting on the North American plate and the ones on the other side are sitting on the African plate. And along that rift valley, they're pulling apart. And in fact, the earth, because it's a creature, I think of earth as a living creature. There's a concept of Gaia, that earth is alive and a creature it bleeds its molten blood. And rising up in that void, when you, just like when you cut your skin, you, you bleed and you bleed warm blood and the blood coagulates and it forms new tissue. Same thing. If you cut into the earth, it bleeds its blood. But no one had actually witnessed the site of what we call crustal genesis, where the earth creates until a group of us, five of us got down in submarine and went down into that crack. And sure enough, there, think about this. There are tens of thousands active volcanoes right now on earth with the vast majority of them underwater. Most people don't realize tens of thousands of active, not just we one have a or question two. for you. Yeah. There is a paper that came out recently. Some scientists measured. Jess, do you remember the details of the paper? Yeah, they were measuring um, all the, when obviously when a deep marine volcano goes off, it releases a lot of energy. Yeah. And they wanted to measure how much energy is released. And they said it would be the equivalent of being able to power uh, the entire United States. Absolutely. They obviously can't harness that energy. But oh, uh, stop right there. Yes, you can. <laughs> Not yet. Not How? Yet. Are you, Bob, are you going to build, you should. There listen. actually, there's a. There's I would a like to be there. This mountain range. There's yep. a piece of this mountain range that pops above water called mm -hmm. Iceland. Iceland is sitting right oh. on that mountain range. And if you go to Iceland, all the homes, everything is powered by that, those volcanoes. But they, yes, they're above water, oh. but the mountain range sticks up in the Azores. It does the same thing. And what they're doing now is using the ability to harness that energy underwater. Right now we're doing it just above water, but it's not a huge leap to begin harnessing the energy of these tens of thousands of active volcanoes. In fact, in Hawaii, where you have the Mauna Loa and Mauna Kea, they're harnessing that geothermal energy. So it will not take a lot of work to go. In fact, we've been working with a team that is doing exactly that tapping that energy which is endless yeah it's cool wait you're working on that technology right now yeah we're working really? on that tech with the yeah, we have a program with the office of naval research where we're tapping that energy we're also tapping all right wait is that classified in navy no, intel that no. you just gave us okay <laughs> this seems too cool i don't to have just to casually kill you or all the people watching that's it. although i <laughs> i served for 30 years in naval intelligence but it anyway, so uh, okay, so how close are we to Also, this? what we've on. discovered, you think, wait till you hear this, Jessica. Not only do we have these volcanoes, we've discovered tens of thousands of methane seeps under the ocean. Oh. Methane seeps that are coming up and venting methane. And we now have another program funded by DARPA, which is a part of the Department of Defense. Oh to tap the methane seeps to power underwater vehicles, gas stations, basically. Cool. Oh, So wow. yeah, there's a lot of cool things going on. Right? So you can go online and look at underwater methane seeps. And we have a program funded by DARPA to turn those into gas stations for our vehicles. Can I come check that out with you sometime? Yeah, we're actually <laughs> gonna, you can watch it live 
when the Nautilus gets at sea, you know, we have, we have a live website for the Nautilus called nautiluslive.org. I'm about to get on my ship. We go to sea on July 3rd. And, but when do we turn on the satellite? Uh, two weeks. In two weeks, we turn on our satellite and that's the guy right there. We turn it on and then I can do everything from here. See, I have my own personal command center and you wouldn't know it, but in a few days I'll sit and you'll think I'm here because I'm sitting in front of a same thing. Uh -uh. I'm on so, the ship. So I can move my spirit around. I keep my body wherever I want it. But see, that's what your generation is going to be doing. And we've started, you know, in fact, we've somewhat accelerated with the pandemic because everyone's Zooming. We've been Zooming for years. Okay, so we didn't get affected. I'm sad to tell everyone, you know, I don't want you to feel bad. We were totally unaffected by the pandemic. We went to sea. We did everything this way. We've been doing a telepresence operation because remember the movie Avatar that James Cameron made? Mm -hmm. You remember in the movie when the war veteran Jake put they put him in a Navi? Remember that scene? So you got a scene though. I'm sure a lot of your people saw the movie. By the way, Jim, I just talked to him. He's doing three more in New Zealand right now. But in the movie, they have a Navi. Now a Navi was what eight feet tall, blue green, had funny ears, and plugged its tail into a dragon. Okay, so they put a Navi down on this bed, and they put Jake next to him, and then, and the eyes open, and Jake was in the Navi. Remember that? Yeah. You re what? Here's my question for you, and most people can't remember. Let's see if you do. What did Jake do the moment he woke up and realized he was in the Navi? Didn't he start running? Yeah, he got and ran out of the room and they thought, oh, he's freaked out. So they went and chased Jake down and they said, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. So why did you run? And he said, I wanted the wind in my face again. Why did he say, I wanted the wind in my face again? Remember? Mm, that one I don't remember. He was paralyzed. He was in a wheelchair. Oh. He couldn't get the wind in his face again. So here's my point. Jake didn't care that he was in this blue green thing with funny ears and a tail. He had legs. And as soon as he realized he could run again, he ran. That's what we're doing, moving spirits. So we're doing exactly what Jim Cameron did in the moving uh, avatar. We're moving spirits because your spirit is indestructible and it can move at the speed of light. So I can do this and be on the Nautilus in another command center. And what's going to happen in your gener the Zoom will be much more. Look at us sitting here. I'm in a super Zoom situation where I can literally go aboard the ship. I can temporarily put my book aside just temporarily. <laughs> <laughs> right here is all the people on the ship. And by the way, I hit these switches. I can, I can travel to different chat rooms because we're all looking at the same thing. So we all have one of these. This is about 20,000 bucks, less than a car. Okay, so you can have one of these. These are cheap. The first one, very expensive, but the subsequent ones, very cheap. So with this, where do you want to go? And here's what's gonna happen soon. You'll have this bandwidth in your home. Does this, does your, is this a demo model? Does it work? Can you punch a button or does it need to stay, the background the need to stay? The ship has to be on. Oh, okay, okay. So the ship comes, you know, I mean, we can run videos for Wait, you. Wait, so where that. are you physically right now? You're on board the Nautilus? I'm directly 200 or in an yards. undisclosed location. I'm, right at this second, I'm 200 yards from President Biden. No way. <laughs> Where's President uh, Biden uh, right now? I have no idea. You're the Naval Intelligence Officer. So you're he's, the. He's right over here at the Coast Guard Academy in New London at the commencement. Uh -huh. Okay, he's at the Coast Guard Academy. I tried to get to my office today. It was like, guys, I got, here's all my security. You know, I had to get through all this stuff to get to my own office. I'm in an old mansion across the street from uh, the Coast Guard Academy on the Conn College campus. 
And that's where I'm, uh, maybe I shouldn't be telling everyone that. Maybe I should. Yeah, yeah. Don't don't release your classic intel. But, so anyway, but, but I have other ones of these. So I have a question here. about, um, do you talk about this in your book maybe, but you mentioned earlier dyslexia. I, in case you can't tell, I'm a little ADD, um, but it's a good thing. And I love your, I'm curious about systems you might've designed for yourself because I think someone might hear, oh, this guy's dyslexic, but you could also say, and he invented telepresence, and he discovered hydrothermal vents, and he discovered the wreck of the Titanic. So people might be like, well, I'm dyslexic. How did he do that? Exactly. Well, read the book. Yeah. Okay. And, th but and this in looks fact, like one on of the those... back of the book is an endorsement by two world experts on dyslexia, doctors Brock and Frenetti Ide, E I D E. And they wrote a seminal book called The Dyslexic Advantage. And that book changed my, because my daughter's dyslexic. I didn't know I was dyslexic. I just knew I was wired different. I was weird. And I saw things differently. I saw the world through a different lens, but I was okay with it because I was successful with it. Who else is dyslexic? Ted Turner, Charles Branson, Steven Spielberg, uh, uh, Albert Einstein, George Washington, Whoopi Goldberg, Henry Winkler, the list is long. Leonardo da Vinci, okay, are dyslexics. Walt Disney. But unfortunately, dyslexics have a high suicide rate. 50% higher probability of committing suicide. In fact, prison population is largely uh, very heavily dyslexic because we don't fit into the non-dyslexic. The rules were written for non-dyslexics. And I, you know, I said, well, you know, I don't want to go by those rules. So I I've know. always been out of the box, but fortunately I've been able to be successful living out of the box, but some aren't. So my, in the, in the book, you know, it's really interesting. I, we're giving it away, but okay. Uh, when I was working with my co-author, who's a cool guy himself. His name is, is uh, Chris Drew, who wrote the seminal book on the Cold War called The, the uh, Blind Man's Bluff, which was our top secret program, blew our, blew our cover and everything, uh, on what we were doing, how we won the Cold War. I asked Chris, I said, so I'm, I want to talk about being dyslexic. And so when we, he said, we're going to talk about it when you found out about it. Well, I was 62 when I found out I was just like, Oh, I guess, I guess this will give stuff away. So I guess it says in the book, the moment you found out and what let you know. Okay, yes, carry on. You're 62 well, and you find you out. You know, you can read the reviews. The reviews blow it anyway, you know, okay. So we're getting really, really good reviews. Uh, so anyway, I have embraced it. It's, I'm also ADHD as so are my kids. In fact, my uh, son, Dougie, who's in the book and pictures, all my kids have gone to see with me. Uh, and uh, my Dougie had, I put on his a mirror when he brushed his teeth in the morning, a simple little saying, it said, my body is like a race car. And when I learn how to drive it, I'm going to win lots of races. And he's now learned how to drive his car, as has my others. My kids have all learned how to drive their, how to drive. Uh, although one I lost in a car accident, uh, as you know. And I feel so, my heart reached out to Ray Dalio, as you know, uh, lost his son as well. So, yes. But anyway, it's been, it's been an interesting discovery of my gift. And I'm standing on the soapbox telling the world, wow, if you're dyslexic, which is close to 15, 20% of the population, but most people won't admit it because they, they've been told they're stupid and they're not. They're just wired differently. And if you learn how to use your wiring, I mean, I, here I am. I'm a, I'm a clear case example of how dyslexia made me, period, done. Wow, I'm, I'm feeling uh, very stirred right now because uh, I, think, I think neurodivergence like this runs in families. So my uncle and my dad and my brother and I are all kind of weird, weirdos mm -hmm. wired like this. Well, here's a, I ask you to do the following. Go online and look up open dyslexic font. 
and read something and see if your speed picks up. That's an acid test for not all dyslexics, for a lot of dyslexics, open dyslexic. In fact, Disney, uh, who's dyslexic, the Disney company, which is publishing my book, uh, is releasing my book in dyslexic font and audio. I'm typing it right now, open dyslexic, home. It's a typeface designed you against- Under wow. image, do you see example of the font? You can get an app and it puts everything in dyslexic font. Oh, I should have been doing this sharing my screen. I, but- um, Yeah, if you go to, if you just type on Google, open, dys, uh, open dyslexic font and go to image, it'll give you stuff in that font. And I carry it around on my phone uh, because I like to, I admit like situations like this, people say, I think I'm, there it is. Now, if you start reading something in that font there, right? There it is. Are you reading faster? It feels really clean on my brain. How does That's, this font uh, work? You're, you're, you're it kid. That's the acid test. If all of a sudden your brain clears up and you read faster, get this app and download see it where is it download now well what's download the mechanism how does this work why does that work so well well it was designed by a dyslexic i don't know maybe you can do the reason all i care is it works yeah it's and, amazing thank you for telling me about it but i mean look at it most when i show it like i said i carried it around on my cell phone because then people i i talk about it and they said well i think i'm dyslexic you want to find out and I boot it up. And if you're non-dyslexic, you can go, that's sort of weird. It doesn't do anything for you. And it doesn't do it for all dyslexics, but a significant percentage because we're all wired slightly different. For, for those, they go, their jaw drops and they go, what is this? Because you feel it. Like you just felt it. You feel yeah. it. Well, there it is, kid. You want to get the app that then moves everything into that font. My mind is automatically. Blown. That Isn't was a cool? really good. That's so cool. And that was a good little like chapter discussion we had on sort of moving spirit and telepresence. And I'm just trying to make sure we hit all our big picture points. So, I mean, we haven't even gotten to hydrothermal vents. We haven't talked about that's that. cool. That was an Titanic amazing yet. So, there so, they are right there. In fact, you know, in the, in the book, there, there they are. You know, in the book, uh, we have this the opening epilogue of the book is when my mom calls me after I got home from the PR blitz. And, mm -hmm. and again, my mom's Kansan and, and I'm the thir first of 13 generations to go to college and graduate. So my mom, although was very smart, she was the classic stay home and raise the kids. But my mom was brilliant. And she followed all my discoveries of of hydrothermal vents and black smokers and all of that and knows the science significant science behind it and so in the opening part she said it's too bad you found that rusty old boat and moms are always right because i've been labeled with that one but mm -hmm. i'm proudest of that one jessica you should ask your question we had that exact question <laughs> yeah we were gonna when I had read the book and I thought it was fantastic, my main thing that came to mind was I kept thinking of what your mom said about being known for the rusty boat. And I was like, I wanted to know, in your opinion, if you didn't find the Titanic or it just wasn't as popular for some reason, what would you want people to go up to you and be say, say that you, you were the are Titanic known guy? How about the, how about the original life on earth? That's not bad mm -hmm. and the probability of finding it elsewhere in the universe and even within our own solar system that's not bad in fact it, we're working with nasa we're designing flights to two moons the moon of, of one moon of jovian moon called uh, io and europa and in particular europa and a saturn moon called enceladus because both those moons or, well, actually, the Saturn and Jupiter have their own solar system in what are called moons, but it's sort of like their own little mini solar systems. And on those two moons slash planets, kind of, I think of, they have more water oceans than we have on our planet. Let that sink in. 
these two moons have oceans that contain more water than the water we have in our oceans, which covers 72% of our planet. The average depth of our oceans is a few miles. Theirs is 60 mile deep. And we believe they have active volcanoes and they should have, voila, we don't know if they'll have worms, they're gonna have somebody really weird living in those. And so that's about as cool as it gets. Plus it, it told us, because these guys, show them the one with the blood, you know, and they show them the one where the, I picked up this clam that was a mile, a, a foot across. You Look picked it up barehanded? <laughs> yeah, see this guy? It has human, see the blood? It looks like beef, right? Yeah. It, it has human-like blood. And when I cut this guy open, it didn't have the internal organs of a clam. Talk about outer space stuff. This clam had no internal organs, no mouth, no gut, no digestive. See that picture of that weird stuff? That's a bacterium called an extremophile, a primitive bacterium we didn't know existed that is living inside the, the body of that clam and inside the body of those 13 foot tube worms. Go back to the tube worms. That tube worm that's shown right here is sticking out its lung. See that red thing? That's mm -hmm. its lung. And it's ingesting poisonous hydrogen sulfide gas that would kill you and I and plants in an instant. We fill this room with hydrogen sulfide gas, we're toast in seconds. Yet this bacterium living in that tube worm, I got one just recently, 13 feet tall, and it has human-like blood, and it had a conversation over time that the bacteria convinced the clams and the tube worms and other creatures living in these underwater hot springs to take over its body. Wow, what a conversation that was. And then it said to the clam and it said to the tube worm, I want you to stick your lung out and breathe poisonous gas. Sure, how, can you believe the, how, how the, just work with me, it said, I don't wanna live in this fire hydrant of vents where I'm blowing, I, I need to live in a body because I'll get blown away otherwise. And let me, uh, and feed me and I'll feed you better than you can feed yourself. And that was the deal they cut. It's called chemosynthesis. Mm -hmm. And what that means is we are not alone in the universe. All, because this bacterium can travel on meteorites. This is a hardy sucker. It's called an extremophile. It can live extremely, extremely harsh conditions. And those are all throughout the universe. So there's life throughout the universe. There's intelligent life throughout the universe, but there's a kicker. There's a kicker. You can't get there. So, but there's aliens Humans here. Not leave the solar system. There is no plan B for the humans. We're stuck on Earth. We're not going to live on Mars. Who wants to live on Mars? We want to live on Earth. Superman had a choice. He didn't go to Mars. He came to Earth, didn't he? Okay. So, my point is this is that's a little more important than finding a rusty old boat that I knew already existed. Wouldn't you say? And my uh, mom knew definitely. that. <laughs> well, speaking of what's more important, the rusty boat or the origin of life, my next power ranking question for you is not quite such a binary, but we've been talking, uh, my colleagues and I, you know, there's a lot in the news right now about going to Mars. And you might also, can we talk with you again when the government releases their data about unidentified flying and or floating objects? Sure. But my question to you is, can you talk about the connections between ocean exploration and the search for life in other, I mean, you sort of just did, oh, but it's like, all I, one think the same. People do, I, mean, I think people don't realize how, um, what we we're going to find here. In your lifetime, I don't know if we'll get to mine at 79 in a few days, but in your lifetime, we will find life within our own solar system. And I wish we could get it over with because it won't match what we're about to destroy here. See, I'm not worried about Earth surviving for billions of years. It's just a teenager. It's gonna do just 
fine. I don't worry about life surviving. There'll be life here in billions of years. The bet is, will we even survive this century? And many people say we won't survive because of the stupid things we're doing right now. We, the, we are now ex extinguishing almost everything on the planet. What a dumb thing to do. We are, we are, we are now really ticking off Earth and life. I think the pandemic is Earth and life's attempt to get rid of us. I think, I think it has declared war on us. And unless we clean up our act, it will win. We, we're not going to win this battle. We well, will lose. It's the Earth chemosynthetic the relationship that you were describing, right? The exactly. creatures and the vents said, we'll be good partners and hosts if, we if have you to help be. me. Right. Out of but we're not being good micro right now. We must cut a deal with Earth. We got to go back. It's, it's called the concept of Gaia. Have you ever heard that? Yes. G-A-I-A. And not that I'm supposed to promote other books, but I'm going to. You want to read The Nature of Nature by a colleague of mine called Enrique Sala, another explorer at National Geographic. His book, I just got it. Again, I get mine in audio. And I was listening because I drive back and forth. I have offices and I, at the Interspace Center is an hour away. So I sit in my car and I listen to tapes. And I just finished, I, I was driving home just two days ago from my inner space center to my house and, and I wasn't quite done. So I parked the car, got out and I have a little bench on the front of my house and I sat there to finish that nature of nature. And I called Enrique immediately, tears. And I said, Enrique, I wanna be a disciple of yours. Th this explains it all so beautifully. And we, because I am a believer of Gaia, by the way, of Lock, Lockhart, who developed the theory, is dyslexic. Ta-da! You know, so and I keep coming back to that, don't I? But anyway, uh, I, what, I, what I want you to do is to realize that we're toast if we don't come to peace with our planet because it's going to kill us. But it's going to get rid of us. You say we're toast. But you also seem optimistic. So yep, yep I do. Talk about look at that. <laughs> hey, look at the numbers on COVID. We we have the intellect. If you listen to science, please. Uh, we look how fast they got that vaccine online. That was miraculous. Look at the numbers today, even in the world. Finally, oh, well, we got to talk to Brazil a little. But India is starting to. I mean, look at the world as of this present second, and you'll see it. We're getting it down there. We still not there, but I know in Northeast where I live, all the Northeast is largely vaccinated. We, we have all sorts of nice time. I just had a wonderful get together with people that I, I hugged some people the other night for it the feels first time in a year. I hugged humans. Because we're we're doing what science says to do. Take the vaccine, you idiot. You know, Isn't and that... uh, once you do that, da da. So I'm optimistic, but only if we finally get society to to look at what science is telling you. Well, it goes back to the hydrothermal vents example. It seems like if you really look at what is going on in nature that gives you the blueprint for how we can coexist. Exactly. Just, it, oh, it's it right be, there. It can be one. Do you realize though, that as we sit here this very second, we have tracked down and killed 90% of all the large fish in the ocean. Let that sink in. We have tracked down and murdered 90% of all the large fish in the ocean because we are still hunter gatherers in the ocean. Thousands of years ago, we on land domesticated animals and cultivated crops and shifted from hunter gatherers to farmers and herders. 
okay? But not in the ocean. We're still primitive hunter gatherers. Now you see that water behind you, okay? Here's something you want to go on YouTube and look at. It's called the Valella Project. Writing that Valella down. The Valella Project. It's a video and you watch it and it presents the case of how we can turn the tide. And as you know, one of the, uh, what, what, what he did was, I served on a presidential commission days after 9-11. I was, I tried to get my first meeting. I was the first plane in the air to go to- Rough to, day to, for a meeting. That, that must was a have rough been day. Weird. But I, it was the first day they let planes get back up in the sky. And I served on that presidential commission. I listened to 500 expert witnesses for two years. And we wrote a blueprint. But what we, what we are been able to show you, I, I had at these hearings, people that were doing aquaculture in the ocean and environmentalists. And they came in and they wanted to kill one another. And I said, wait, uh, if you don't behave, I'll throw you out of the room, children. So they sat there and I said, I said to the environmentalist, why do you hate that guy over there? He said, because he is aquaculturing top predators, salmon or whatever. And that's the dumbest way on the planet to make protein is to feed a fish that was top, what we call an apex top predator fish. And then they put it in shallow water, poops all over the place, pollutes everything and blah. So then this guy named Neil Sims from Australia bills off Hawaii, off the big island of Hawaii, the Villela project. So what did he do? He took a fish that we pay a lot of money for at a sushi restaurant called uh, Kampachi or Hamachi. It's a, it's a yellowtail sushi fish that sells for $17.50 a pound uh, wholesale. He took this predator fish out in the water behind you that had nothing in it. Tropical water, the warmer water is, the less it can hold nutrients. So it becomes beautifully clear. Why? There's nothing in it. Okay, where's all the fishing done? Up in the high latitudes where it's, you can't see really well because of all that krill and bacteria gets in the way, okay? All the plankton, that's where everyone goes to eat. But in the water you like to have behind your head, there's nothing in it, okay? So he took these fish out into water where there was nothing in 12,000 feet of water off uh, of the Kona coast. And he said, let's have a conversation. I'm gonna put you in a cage in this water full of nothing and I'm gonna give you a choice. I'm gonna flip you from being a carnivore to a herbivore. And I'm gonna feed you soybean. And you get fish going, yeah, sure. You're gonna feed me soybean. You're gonna feed me a plant and I'm a predator? They said, yeah, or die. Well, guess what? That fish was smarter than us. He said, well, if that's the case, I guess I'll become a, a, a herbivore. And guess what? Thriving? And in the same amount of time it takes to bring a pig to market, which sells for a buck 50 a pound, and this is selling at $17. A, you, he's now turning the ocean into farms, but he's turning in the ocean into farms where nothing's growing. And in fact, because he's in 12,000 feet of water, when the fish poops, the poop goes down and is sequestered and it gets a carbon sequestration credit. This is brilliant and it's scalable. So yeah, you want to you wanna preserve areas, yes. And I'm all for Biden's 30 by 30. And I'm working with, to, to, we're gonna be exploring the coral reefs of America starting this year uh, off Hawaii and all of Western and Central Pacific with our ship, the Nautilus. We're gonna be studying 90% of the coral reefs. But you need to preserve 30 by 30. 30 is 30% of the oceans that America owns and 30% of the land we own, because then they become nurseries and things leak out of them. And then everyone bounces back. So the key is if you give mother nature a chance before you extinct, extinct, uh, extinguish it, you know, once you've gotten rid of the animal altogether, you're toast. But as long as they're still viable, they'll bounce back. We were sitting on the back porch in, in, in Connecticut and saw our first mother bear and daughter and, and, and father bear with a cub. We never seen that in all the years we've lived here. And there was coyotes, mountain lions. It's all, someone 
accidentally just hit a moose. We've never seen moose. They've all come back into Connecticut. It's amazing because we stopped shooting them. Okay. Now you still need those top predators. And, and what uh, Enrique did, he has a program with National Geographic called Pristine Seas, where he went to places that no one had mucked up yet. And he found they're dominated by top predators. The top predators are the ones that control the health of the ocean. And we've gone and killed 90% of them. What a stupid thing to do. Bingo. But, but it also sounds pretty easy. It sounds like these waters behind me, you're telling me they're like nature's gift to us, the fertile it is. farmland it of is. the sea. Oh, I'm very optimistic because I guess if we can crack COVID-19, that maybe the public will start to believe that maybe we can crack a few other problems for them. And we it's a solution, so, but we need really, the public to do it. I'm sorry, I stepped on you when you said oh, we need right. solutions, but we need people to do it. Um, this, this is really surprising to me because the, the documentary Sea Spiracy has a lot of you know, younger folks on social media saying, um, oh, we should stop eating fish. But what you're telling me is, it's not that we should stop eating fish, no. it's that we should change our relationship to fish. Yeah, we, we, we do exactly, we stop eating the top predators unless we flipped them to herbivores, which they did. Go, go watch the show, hit YouTube, Valella Project, and you'll see them take this predator fish that loves to eat other fish, which is the crazy way of making protein. You wanna eat at the base. What do we eat? We don't eat lions and tigers and bears. We don't eat the top predators. We eat, we eat uh, chickens and pigs that eat grass. We eat things that way down at the bottom of the trophic level. We eat things that are herbivores. We're not eating carnivores. In the ocean, we're eating carnivores. We're totally disrupting the food chain. Don't do it. You just solved the whole problem right there. It sounds so simple when you put it that way. Well, it is. You know, science, if you can't explain what you're doing to a middle school kid, you don't know what you're doing. Okay. It's not rocket science. Plate tectonics, you should have seen the theory that preceded plate tectonics called Marshall Kay's geosynclinal cycle on how to make mountain ranges. And when I read that, I said, I don't get it. They said, well, you're just not smart enough. Until plate tectonics came along and explained it to a five-year-old. The book, the early parts of the book before I find the Titanic uh, talks about our discoveries of, and, and confirmation of plate tectonic theory. And it's very straightforward. Plates do this, this, or that end. That's it. And it's something that you can see you just, with your eye. Yeah. You just went down there and you're like, I see it. It's that simple. And I thought that was super fascinating of like, well, how did you prove it? And you're like, I proved it by seeing it. And I'm like, I went down there. Well, first you see science, science is always fun because you you observe something or you hear something and then you say, well let's go prove it. And you develop what are called multiple hypotheses. Uh, the, the, uh, the moon, they thought at one time was made out of cheese. So what you do is you went to the Mars. I mean, you went to the moon, took a, didn't taste like cheese. Gone with that one. Okay, so what you do is you have theories and generally like Amelia Earhart's lost plane, I'm in the middle of that one. But so you have th three theories about how you could explain something and you, design an experiment that has a silver bullet and you you do it and you fire your bullet at it and if it's the wrong theory it kills it until you hit one it doesn't kill done so you create multiple hypotheses are simply five different ways we can dream up to explain something and we go find out and test them and we only end up with one one the right answer only survives the test but commonly you, you, you kill an idea. Sorry, I didn't mean to, but it didn't hold up. And that's what science is all about, is multiple hypotheses. I've gone down a dark, dead end. That's what science, it was a great, there was a great ad I remember years ago on PBS where they showed this scientist at night and it was a building, a big academic building, one light on in the building and this guy's walking 
they then cut into the building and this guy is walking down the hall, real dejected out of his lab, sits down and the camera comes and says, didn't work, did it? No, it didn't. I remember when I didn't find the Bismarck and National Geographic's camera rolling said, didn't work, did it? But I now know where it isn't. I love that line when I, I read it in the memoir. It's just so optimistic and it's great. And well, if you're an optimist and and you live it, it, like me, if you are in control of the game of when to quit, you don't quit until you succeed. Some mm -hmm. will take an hour longer, some will take 10 years longer. My dream to do this took me 30 years to be sitting in this room. I dreamed it in 1981. 1981. Go show did that one. I'll publish in National Geographic a cartoon. And I'll show it to you. See that cartoon? That was published in the 1981 issue of National Geographic. And I said, this is my dream. And guess what? Come back to here. Boom. And now go to my final image, what I wanted to show you. This is my guiding principle to my life. Walt Disney, uh -huh. if you can dream it, you can do it. That's, that's beautiful. There we are. That's, that's, that's power of your dream because it gives you the passion to keep going when you get knocked down. And I've been knocked oh. down a lot, but I get back up because I have a dream. You truly do get back up. Um, and we are going to have to wrap up with a final question, but um, obviously we can see the book in the background. Everyone, if you want to read more about thermal vents, about obviously the Titanic, but also telepresence, there's so much in the book. So you can read Into the Deep by Robert Ballard himself. Um, and I guess if you want to, you mentioned Amelia Earhart. I know that you're searching yep, for we're that. We're getting right ready now. for that one. It's in the back of the book because we, uh, but I want to also plug June 14th on National Geographic is the companion TV show with the book. So make sure June 14th, you watch that because they go beautifully together. But yeah, the book ends on, I didn't get it, but I haven't quit. So yes, we're going back. There, there were three theories on where her plane went down. One that she was captured by the Japanese and taken prisoner. And I don't tend to go on land. So I'll let someone else play with that when they say they buried her plane under a runway. Well, go dig up the runway. If it's there, it's there. The other one was that it was on, a, on an island where she landed and we went and shot a silver bullet in that one. So the remaining one left standing is that she's off Howland Island and we'll be going to Howland Island here after next. Wait, so here. your book ends with a real life, real time cliffhanger. It does. We Isn't that... When can I read train, the book and then people the can book. follow along with you to see whether you succeed on this quest. You're going to you're going to see in the book a picture of me with my dolphins because I was a dolphin trainer. And when I was training dolphins, I was always told stop training when they're really excited. So the book ends with. Tune in next time. I'm really excited and I will tune in next time. I'm going to. um I'm going to, I wrote down everything you told me to write down. So <laughs> I'll tune in. Is that on National Geographic, the TV channel, yep. or can I watch it online somewhere? It'll be on it? National Geographic. Uh, uh, and then it'll be aired later on on Disney Plus. But by the way, on Disney Plus is the Amelia Earhart expedition. But yeah, if you go to uh, uh, watch National Geographic channel, uh, 10 o'clock Eastern, 7 o'clock Pacific time on June 14th is the TV show. And I hope all my dyslexic friends watch that. I, I wrote it down, my ADD, I need to make notes, but I wrote it down. Um, thanks <laughs> for sharing with everybody and thanks everybody for watching.